There are four main types of batteries that we can buy for our boats. Gel, AGM, traction and leisure. But how do we know which is the right one for our boat? Time to head over to Charles Sterling to find out. So what is the best battery for your domestic or leisure battery bank on your narrowboat? Well, first of all, let's understand the fundamentals. A battery is basically a bucket of energy and all these batteries are simply buckets of energy. In the real world, there are only two real requirements for batteries. One is to start your car and the other is to run a forklift truck. The marine market is so small, there is nothing built specifically for the marine market. So any batteries that you are presented with will be moved from some other market. If you want to start a car, you have a starter motor which pulls a lot of current very quickly. And the only way to do that is to have a large surface area of plates and the plates are very thin. Now every time you charge and discharge a battery, bits fall off the plates. The thinner the plates, the larger the surface area, the more bits fall off. So from the point of view of cold cranking, those batteries are great. From the point of view of deep cycling, they're really bad. On the other hand, you have a forklift truck. It's just interested in delivering power at a steady level, so it's not interested in coal cranking. So the two batteries have exactly the same power. One can be pulled out quickly, the other is pulled out slower. The slower one has thicker plates, it will last longer for deep cycling. And that's why you have traction batteries and starter batteries. And the two cannot be mixed. You cannot have coal cranking and deep cycling. People always say, this is my opinion. Um, it's not my opinion. We're an engineering company. We do the tests here regularly. We destroy batteries on a regular basis. Plus the proof is on the battery. If you look at your battery and you see CC or coal cranking, it's a starter battery. Now that doesn't make it a bad thing. You just need to understand where you would use that battery and what to expect from that battery. So first of all, let's explore gel batteries. The German authorities wanted a battery that could turn upside down in a car accident. And if the battery was split, no liquid would escape from the battery. Now this was a safety criteria. It wasn't performance, in which case these are a complete non-starter. Next we come to AGM. AGM are basically the latest derivative from gel. An AGM is fundamentally a lead acid battery with no surplus water. It's great from the point of view of it's got fantastic cold cranking abilities, but you can't charge them quickly because like all batteries, if you charge in excess of 10% of the amp hour capacity, they will gas. There's no surplus water in this battery to be able to deal with the gassing. This is the standard sealed lead acid battery that most of us refer to as leisure batteries. It's simply a car or lorry starter battery with a sticky label on the front, but it does what it says it does on the box. These are fine for leisure applications due to their cost. They are very low cost and they should not be disregarded. And finally, we have my favorite battery for many reasons, deep cycle battery. These can be topped up, they can be abused, they can be cycled deeply, they can be charged quickly, and it's the closest thing you can get at a reasonable cost before you have to go to a forklift truck battery. Okay, so we're down to two batteries now. So the question is, which is the best battery? Well, the reality is this battery is 84 pounds and this battery is 129 pounds. If you are a leisure boat user, which is two weekends per month, plus maybe three to four weeks holiday in the summer, then you will easily get five to six years use out of this battery. However, if you're going to live on board and use your batteries every day, or if you're going on long-term cruising, I would suspect that battery would last you in the region of six months. So for hard use, you've got to use six volt 
traction batteries. Join two six volts together to give you 12 volt and simply build your battery bank up to whatever size you require. You will be looking at these batteries, assuming you charge them correctly in 10 years time. A lot of these exotic batteries are sold on the premise that they are maintenance free. Maintenance free derives from approximately 20 to 25 years ago when you had to top up your battery in your car. But of course, some of us didn't. So the battery companies realized, let's put an inch of water extra in the battery and put a lid over the top and call them maintenance free. And in that market, they are maintenance free. But when you go on to the domestic battery system on a narrow boat, you do a lot of deep cycling and fast charging. The term maintenance free no longer applies. I like to use the term unable to maintain instead of the term maintenance free because these batteries will require maintenance and you cannot give it to them. One final thing to remember is the term guarantee. There are some ludicrous guarantees on these batteries. Well, this is what I call a statistics guarantee. In other words, 90% of the people that buy these batteries don't give them a hard time. 10% give them a hard time. So it's a simple case of increasing the price of a mediocre product in order to accommodate the fact that 90% of the people will not use the batteries hard, 10% will, therefore just simply give the 10% a replacement battery, if you're lucky. So be careful of unrealistic guarantees with batteries because they are exactly that, unrealistic. Now Bowlock in East London probably isn't where you'd expect me to go to check out the capital's latest cinema. But this is UK boating and this isn't just any ordinary cinema. I'm here to meet the team responsible for turning this narrowboat into the floating cinema. So the project started um, uh, about six months ago. Um, it's an art project that's been commissioned by the ODA, the Olympic Delivery Authority, but it's funded by Arts Council England. Um, it's a great project where we've converted um, a narrowboat into a floating cinema, literally. Um, but we don't just do film events, we also do um, tours, talks, performances, and also bigger screenings for canal side audiences. Well, the history of the boat was uh, it came from Stockton in Warwickshire. And basically, it was, it was just a shell. It had the uh, stern cabin and the fore cabin, and that was it. The forward cabin was uh, just a no-go area. We just couldn't get in there. And it was quite dilapidated, actually. When it first arrived, it was very cold winter, was the first time so. Everyone was wearing very thick um, clothing. Um, this hull was very bare. Um, they had a steel element installed. The middle section that we've had added last year, basically there was a scaffolding frame on it with just an old tarp over the top. It looked really odd and we did look quite funny bringing it back and we were sleeping yeah. on it. We had no facilities, no hot water, no toilet. We and we pop were pop-up tents. Up tents on the deck. And Three you know, pop-up tents Luckily the row. weather was, it was cold, it was October, cold but mm. fine. Um, but it was barely painted, um, everything was um, in, not a terrible condition, but quite bare. Uh, that's that really the word I would use, bare condition. Um, so we had to strip a lot of things away, basically, from starting from right from the beginning to the structure and then starting again from there. Well, my role really was um, as, a, as a restorer, really, and as uh, someone who kind of, kind of understands boats um, in helping Jay and Maria in kind of realising their, their design, you know, um, and, and, and building, a, a, building a floating cinema off grid, you know. Okay, so there's the three main elements to the design of this. Um, the first is the base work. So as Jay was saying, it was in a very bare state, so sort of repainting it, fitting a bathroom and a kitchen and sort of making it usable and inhabitable. There's been everything uh, from wiring, uh, the TNG or the lighting, um, restoring the floor, which is this beautiful kind of uh, railway sleepers. Um, we've put a loo in at the front, uh, and then the, the, the battery system as well, um, which is, we've got about 440 amp hours of, of, of battery, so four leisure batteries. That was quite a challenge to make sure that the, the, the power was, was going to be there. Um, but the rest of it was just lots of elbow grease, uh, getting rid of rust, um, endless coats of paint, 
and drilling through through this, which is like it's like ten mil in places. You know, it's just so thick. They don't make them like this anymore. Um, then the second stage was making this outdoor structure. When the boat arrived, this part was just completely open to the elements. Um, and the main idea behind this is it's, it's actually soft, um, and it's a kind of contrast to the, the very kind of hard, crisp, utilitarian um, nature of the existing boat um, as a work boat. Um, and then the third part is the interior of the cinema itself. Um, and for that, we worked with um, several small makers, um, a furniture maker who's made these flip-up seats because it's a very tight space inside there. So to use that, um, to use that sort of flip-up technology, it's very traditional in cinemas, um, to fit all those people in. And then we've also got a curtain, which has been made by a textile designer, which is smocked, um, and that sort of pulls away so that when they're on, when they're on a trip, that you can still see outside. So those are the main... We have a really broad base of customers so far, it's been incredibly popular. We did a series of tours into the Olympic Park, we had probably quite an older audience, um, I would say like 50, 60 plus, um, who were just really interested to learn more about the waterways, but then for other sort of open Thursday drop-in events we've had lots and lots of kids, so it's really been um, wide and varied. The future um, at the end of this community project uh, will be hopefully to appeal to many people as possible. We want, we really want people to start exploring the area because these waterways are so little known. Obviously with the Olympic Stadium being so close and a half a mile away, it, uh, it is attracting more, air, more people to the area. I think there's limited um, opportunities to get on the actual water. I think a lot of people, more and more people are using the canals and waterways and the towpaths and bicycling and that kind of thing. But to actually sort of get on the waterways, particularly for free as well, um, is just an, an amazing opportunity. That's what people have been saying to us. And they've also been saying that they're going to start using the canals and waterways more, which is great news. And we'd like to do some sort of natural um, flora, fauna, conservation, that sort of thing. Local history tours as well. And um, really, it's open to, uh, to everyone who enjoys the waterways or would like to learn and experience more about the waterways. It's been an absolutely fantastic experience meeting the team of the Floating Cinema today. Their passion and enthusiasm behind the project is catching. And if you're in London, between now and the end of September, I really would recommend that you look them up. Well, that's it for this episode of UK Boating. Don't forget you can watch it again on Monday and Thursday, 8pm, and Sunday, 8.30pm, on Information TV. Next time, I'll be visiting another marina, and Charles will be here to tell us how to get the best out of our batteries. Until then, happy cruising.